Shalom, everybody. Shalom. Shalom. And it's great to be here in the wonderful state of Texas to celebrate another Feast of Tabernacles. So I don't know about you, but uh, my first Feast of Tabernacles was 1998. And uh, so uh, it's been quite a few of them. And uh, um, each one um, I look forward to coming to and the Lord always blesses us when we gather together to celebrate his feast. Amen. Yes, he does. So I want to share with you uh, a message that is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, that whenever I learn of it, like many of the things that the Lord's taught me over the years, I got very excited. And when I get excited about a particular message, you know, I want to be able to share it with others. So I've entitled this message, The Testimony of Yeshua. And the foundation, which I'm not going to go over the statement I'm going to make now, for understanding the testimony of Yeshua is knowing and understanding that it was Yeshua that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. You see, we've been programmed from dispensationalism and in traditional church that if we're reading something from the Tanakh and it says God, we just automatically write God the Father. So when we talk about the creation of the heavens and the earth, and we say, well, God created the heavens and the earth, uh, we write in our minds, God the Father. Yet in John chapter 1, verse 3, John chapter 1, verse 10, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, etc., it says that many times in the New Testament, and I've uh, not even mentioned it in reverse, that it was Yeshua that created the heavens and the earth. That... In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, it is quoting Psalm chapter 40, verse 7, that in the volume of the book, or in the totality of Scripture, it is written of him. And Yeshua said in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, that the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms are written of him. Not foreshadow him, but they're written about him. That's because it was actually Yeshua that created the heavens and the earth, it was Yeshua that made covenant with Abraham. That's right. It was Yeshua that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. It was Yeshua that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. Yes. And so given that Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, that's where I get the title of this message, The Testimony of Yeshua. So without elaborating in, in uh, a great detail, you know, it says in uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, uh, the King James says, And the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses at the burning bush, which is quoted in Acts chapter 7. It says, And the angel that spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai. Well, when we read the word angel, we're going to think of, we normally might think of Gabriel or Michael or somebody in the angelic class. But the Hebrew word that got translated as angel is malak. And malak means a messenger. And so an angel is a messenger of the Father, but not all messengers are angels. So if he sends you uh, to go speak somewhere or to do something, now you become his messenger. And so it was the messenger that spoke to Moses, the burning bush. And that same messenger said, when I bring my people out of Egypt. And I don't know if you've, um, really thought about the Torah legality of Yeshua dying on the tree and shedding his blood. Um, if he didn't make covenant with Abraham, if he didn't give the Torah at Mount Sinai, where is the legality of his shed blood to redeem his people in the world from sin? It's directly connected to he made covenant with Abraham and he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, which has made his death on the tree and the shedding of his blood a legal covenant matter. And so that being the case, in titling this message, The Testimony of Yeshua, I'm going to show you uh, what is called the testimony. The Torah is called the testimony. 
And there's only been one person in my life that I've ever heard of the following definition of Torah that I'm going to give you, which is in the Bible. But I just never heard anyone give the, this definition. And it is this. Uh, well, first, I'll give credit to um, how I came to be aware of it. I was in Norway speaking, and I was invited to speak at somebody's house. And the, and, and the host of the house came up and said, do you know that Torah or the Ten Commandments is broken down into da-da-da? And I said, well, I never heard it that way. I heard it this way, but not that way. And so it caused me to go up and look at every occurrence and everything, and that's when it all came together. So here's a definition of Torah that I've only ever heard from one person. That was that person in Norway. Torah equals statutes plus judgments. Because normally, at least me and others, when we... When we read and keep my commandments and my statutes and my judgments, whatever, we just don't label it as the Torah. Well, it is all Torah, but Torah is a general term. It's vanilla. It's not specific at all. Now, if I want to get specific, a statute and a judgment becomes specific. And so we don't normally speak in everyday English, and we don't normally use the word statutes and judgments. So um, I did, uh, back in 2013, um, a teaching that's called the Marriage Covenant Agreement and Lawsuit, where I, in essence, went from Mount Sinai to Revelation and went over what the Bible had to say about the judgments of God. And actually, what the Torah calls judgments is the category of commandments that are associated with how you treat other people. And that category of commandments is summarized in loving your neighbor as yourself. And so when we think of and when we might say, well, the church doesn't follow the Torah. Well, that's not true. They follow the judgment part of the Torah. In other words, they emphasize um, treating other people properly. But when we say that the church doesn't follow the Torah, what we're really saying, although we don't explicitly say it, is the traditional church has rejected the statutes of the Torah. Well, whenever this person shared with me Torah as statutes plus judgments, I wasn't quite sure what the Bible was called a statute. So I went up that night, I got my Bible program out, and I looked everywhere where it it used the word statute, so I got an idea of what a statute was. And so here's the, the main element of what the Bible calls statutes. The dietary laws, the weekly Sabbath, and the annual biblical festivals are the primary, and, and keeping the new moon. So that's not the, the entire list, but that's the central core of the list of statutes. Now, the... The Torah, as, as we know, is broken down into two major categories. The greatest commandment, love Yahweh, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second greatest, love your neighbors yourself. So actually, loving your neighbors yourself is the summarization of the category of the Torah commandments called judgments. And loving Yahweh is doing what he says or what he decrees. And so what is under the category of loving Yahweh is keeping his statutes. So um, what is a statute? Well, we're all familiar with it, statutes, particularly in the last year and a half. It's a decree by somebody in authority who's able to make the decree because they're in that place of authority. So, a statute in our land is you got to wear a mask. No. And uh, you need to get vaccinated or else uh, you're going to lose your job. But you have to get vaccinated. If you have over 100 employees, you know, everyone's got to be vaccinated. That is a statute. It's a decree right. by somebody in authority. And because they're in the place of authority, the decree, the decree is expected to be followed. Now, the category of commandments of judgments 
which is treating other people properly, they're logical. Because uh, do you realize that you do not have to be a believer in Yeshua? You could be an atheist and you still expect to be treated properly. You know, uh, if you uh, go to an atheist and um, hit them across the side of the, of the, of the mouth, you know, they're, they're not going to like it very well. And, and uh, so that they don't like being punched in the face has nothing to do whether they believe in Yahweh or not. They just don't personally like it. And they don't like to be disrespected. And they don't like to be cheated. And they don't like to be lied to. And so uh, basically, people expect other people to treat them properly. And it has nothing to do with whether you believe in the God of Israel or not. And so those category of commandments are logical. Like I said, even to unbelievers. But a statute, a decree, most of the time, often, is not logical. And so if you would take a survey of all Americans, is it logical for you to wear a mask? You're not going to get 100% of the people say, oh, yeah, I think I should wear a mask. Or do you think you should be vaccinated? You're not going to get 100% agreement. But I bet you, you can get 99% of people to agree that they don't like being punched in the face. <laughs> okay, so ironically, if you would ask the average Christian, uh, do you love Yahweh with all your heart? And they'd say, oh yeah. But if you really find out what they're saying yes to about loving him, it boils down to this feeling in your heart, you know, in my heart, I got this feeling and I got this thought that I loved him. Well, if you know anything about the Hebrew language, and you know who's the best that I've ever heard about teaching the Hebrew language? Red Scott. Yes. And so uh, I grew up all the way here from Ohio, and you know who I listened to the whole time? Red Scott. Red Scott. And so the only thing about Hebrew, um, it's verb oriented which means it's action-oriented, which means it's expecting you to do something. And that's why in the book of James it says, faith without works, without doing something about it, is dead. And so, uh, really, like Brad likes to say, none of, none of this Hebrew stuff is complicated. It's all represented by, you know, a house and a family and a garden and, you know, what you see every day. And so it's interesting if we go to church and uh, what people think about, about loving Yeshua, loving Yahweh, they're going to relate it to this feeling. And, and actually what they love to hear, what draws a lot of people, is God is love, 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 grace, 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 grace. And Yeshua did it all. And you don't have to do nothing. And so since you don't have to do nothing, and he loves you, loves you, loves you anyhow, and you really don't have to do anything because he loves you, loves you, loves you anyhow, and if you do do something, then it's grace, 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 grace. Then they say, oh, I love it. And, and, and you somehow think that that makes sense. But uh, you know who really knows what love is? A woman. See, if a man says, I do to you, and for the next 20 years, he never does anything for her. He never says, I love you. Uh, you know, 20 years have passed. He's never said, I love you. And she said, well, don't you love me? I mean, I'm, yeah, I told you 20 years ago I loved you. Didn't I? I'm sorry, it's not going to go over very well. And, and if she doesn't, and if he isn't a part of her life and helping her and, 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 and showing that he cares, you know, she's not going to think after a while that he loves me. There's something wrong. So she sees love as doing something. Amen. So uh, if that is how a woman is wired, how is it when we go to church that we think loving is not doing anything? It's this feeling. So what if your husband said, oh, the feeling in my heart, you know, we dated and we got married, and I have this feeling in my heart that I love you. And I always got this feeling in my heart that I love you. And 
and it never goes away. But she goes, but you don't ever do anything. You don't ever talk to me. You know, you never, never say you love me. You, you never help me out with things, et cetera. Well, she's not going to buy it, even though you said I got this feeling. Okay, so uh, uh, loving Yahweh, you show him you love him, and it's by keeping his commandments, and it's by keeping his statutes is a part of loving him, and it's the primary category of loving him. And Yahweh expects you to show him to do something. Faith without works is dead. So, the the Hebrew word for testimony, the title of this message is the testimony of Yeshua. So uh, the Hebrew word for testimony is a doot. So one of the things that I want to do is show you in Hebrew, Hebrew is a spiritual language. And spiritual truths are related in the language that is not in other languages of the world. Amen. And how spiritual truths are related and connected in the Hebrew is you have in the Hebrew language, your core word is in a two or three letter root. And words that have the same two or three letter roots are called family words. And they're conceptually related to each other somehow, which means they're since Hebrew is a spiritual language that it's spiritually related to each other. So, the Hebrew word for testimony is a dut, and there is a Hebrew linguistic, which means there's a spiritual relationship between that which the lawgiver gave, his Torah, which is called testimony, and the people that he gave it to, the nation of Israel, and what he expected them to do with it. That relationship is in the Hebrew. So how is that so? Well, because testimony in Hebrew is a dut. And the root of a dut is aid or ed, which in Hebrew means a witness. So the Torah is the witness of the lawgiver and this with this testimony the torah was given to the congregation of israel and the hebrew word for congregation is adah and the root of that is aid or ed which means a witness so, a dut, testimony, the Torah is the testimony. So, the Torah and the people that it was given to, the congregation, a da, both words are connected to and associated with the word witness. So, the lawgiver, Yeshua, gave his Torah, which is the testimony, a dut, to the congregation of Israel, a da, and they, the people, the congregation, Israel, were to be a witness to the world of the righteousness of in the mercy of the person that gave the Torah. And so when they failed to do so, so when you think of the word witness, the word witness, because it's all related to witness. 
When you think of the word witness, what primarily comes to your mind? What setting comes to your mind? A witness. Courtroom. Courtroom. So actually in Hebrew, these words are showing a legal relationship and a legal connection. Because everything about the Torah is a legal matter. And so, um, one of the names for the enemy is Satan. And what does Satan mean? Adversary. You know what the image of adversary is? He's the lawyer that argues the other side in court. That's literally what adversary means. And so, Hasatan's name connects you to a court setting where he's he's being the lawyer. Hasatan's the lawyer. And he's arguing against the Torah. Yeah. And so, um, Yeshua has his lawyers, even though he is a lawyer, he has his lawyers that represent him in court. And you know what the name of his lawyers are? And the prophets. Amen. So when his people, the Ada, when they failed to be the proper testimony, a dude of the justice and righteousness of the lawgiver in his Torah, the lawgiver brought a covenant lawsuit against his people and the agents by which he brought the lawsuit was the prophets and the prophets made charge against the people that they weren't following the Torah of the lawgiver. So what the prophets did is the prophets testified to the people failing to be the proper witness of the lawgiver. So they testified. Well, the word testify in Hebrew is the word witness with a vav in the middle of it. It's ood. So, the Torah is a testimony that is the Edut. It was given to the congregation, Eda, and they were to be witnesses of the justice and righteousness of the lawgiver. And when they failed to do so, the God of Israel brought a covenant law through his prophets who testified against them. And so this relationship that I just shared with you, it is all connected in the Hebrew. And so once again, you could see in the Hebrew the relationship of the lawgiver, what he gave, his Torah, who he gave it to, the people, and what he expected to be a witness of him and his Torah. So what does the enemy try to do? He tries to separate that relationship. So now in our modern world, in our religious world, those who proclaim belief in the God of Israel, um, we have those that say that Yeshua is the Messiah but they got him disconnected from the Torah. Yeah. They actually say that the lawgiver died on the tree to do away with the law. his own law. <laughs> so they can disconnected him from what he gave. And then we have a people that's called Israel, who we kind of connect, who we kind of associate with the Jewish people. <laughs> And that in associating the Jewish people see a connection of themselves to the Torah, but they're disconnected from the Messiah. And so there's been a, a separation 
of this relationship that we see in the Hebrew language. Um, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to share with you uh, this interesting thought. Um, you know, somehow by uh, being brought up in America, um, including myself, at one time, I was taught to believe that the best government in the world is the Constitution of the United States and being in a democratic republic. But um, what type of government, and where's the roots of our, of our government? Where does it go to? Well, we have, for example, something that's called a Senate. What's Senate associated with? Rome. Rome had, Rome had Senate. Where do we trace democracy to? Greece. Yeah. So our government is Greco-Roman. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't need to give you a lot of examples and uh, convince you that in America, America is a melting pot. So it's a mixture of peoples and cultures and whatever. And uh, you know what? Something that's mixed is called in the Bible? Babylon. So we are, we got a Greco-Roman form of government and we're living in a Babylonian society. Is it any wonder why Every year that we live, it seems like our country is getting farther and farther away from the God of Israel as our children are not reared in the admonition of the Lord that um, the, the Greco-Roman Babylonian society kind of overwhelms them. So in our governmental setup, we have an executive branch and we have a legislative branch and we have a judicial branch. And because of how human beings are, um, in order for these to at least somewhat function um, somewhat well, we need to have separation of powers um, amongst them. But I want to read to you Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. It says, The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. So, it says the Lord is our king. What's that? Well, he's the executive branch. Um, the Lord is our lawgiver. What's that? Well, that's the legislative branch. And the Lord is our judge. What's that? Judicial. That's a judicial branch. So actually, Yahweh Yeshua, um, he's the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Mm -hmm. And you know who thought that that was not right? Well, um, even though the scripture may not explicitly say what I'm, I'm telling you now, if I take a principle that this world is a blueprint of the spiritual world, take that principle, that if you accept that principle, what I see in this world, I can know how it was and is in the spiritual world. So what Tosatan is doing now is the same thing that he did do because he his character and his nature does it change? So what he's doing now is what he did before Adam and Eve. You know, the Bible says that he stirred a rebellion in the heavens and got cast out. So even though the Bible doesn't give us a lot of details about the rebellion, I can just put two and two together and uh, I can surmise what one of his many arguments was against Yeshua, who's the executive branch and the legislative branch, and the judicial branch, he was trying to make the claim that he's a dictator and, and that he has all the power and that is not right and that is not fair. Because you know what? 
Um, you know what happens if you disagree with the Torah, if you disagree with Yeshua? Where do you got to go to resolve the issue? To heaven's court. And who's the judge of heaven's court? And how do you think he's going to rule? He's going to rule according to his Torah. So it's like, where do I get to voice my thought and my belief and my concern? So therefore, you can see that the enemy argued that this setup is fundamentally unfair and that um, everyone should be able to express their own opinion and their own opinion should have validity because my opinion is just, just as good as your opinion, right? Who, what makes your opinion better than mine? So therefore, um, the best form of operating this world, this universe, is a democracy. And we don't have one set of rules that's governed by this one judge that everything has to be according to his set of rules that if I think this is all right, good for me, and you think that's all right, good for you, shouldn't that be acceptable without punishment? Well, what in essence is the argument that's being made in our world today as it's going more and more secular? It's just that. Uh, there shouldn't be any rules. There shouldn't be any boundaries. You shouldn't judge me and I shouldn't judge you. And if I feel this is right, then it should be right. And if you feel that's right, it should be right. And all of our voices should have merit. But, you know, at the people who advocate that, they're double-minded because while they advocate that, you know, respect everybody, who they don't respect is the God of Israel and his people and his ways. Um, but um, anyhow, um, one of the things um, that we learn about the Bible, if we dig into it deeper, is the reason why we're living in this world is because we are a part of this spiritual conflict that in our realm of time is still unresolved. And in our realm of time, it will not get resolved until we get to the end of days. And what happens when we get to the very final end of days? We must all stand before the judge and see the Messiah. And in Hasatan's rebellion doesn't get fully resolved until what? He gets thrown into the lake of fire. And so we are a part of this spiritual battle in our world. And so, what ultimately um, is Yeshua going to use this world to demonstrate ultimately before heaven's court? Because it says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 that all things were made by him and for him. Wait a second. Wasn't life good for Yeshua the way it was? Why Why was there, why did he feel that there had to be a, a need to create a world for him? What was it quite right that I needed to have this world for me? Well, what really happened is Yeshua was accused because he's the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. So he was accused of being unjust and unrighteous. But you know why this, this is the um, form of government um, uh, in heaven's government? Meaning, meaning that um, the king and the lawgiver and the judge is all one? Because he follows his Torah, and this, what I'm about to say next, is the, 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 the key of all keys. He rules and reigns in justice and righteousness. He's fair. He's true. Even though he's got this position of power, he doesn't abuse it. He, he truly judges all things properly. And you know what the Torah says about how we're supposed to judge things? is We're supposed to make a careful examination. And we must know all facets and all elements in order to make a proper judgment. So the, the Bible says that uh, that the Almighty knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart. So he is able 
to make a proper judgment on all matters and all things, even regarding us. So, um, um, I don't know how deeply um, you've thought about your life in this world and why this world exists and, and why you're on this planet, but I have figured out that I was basically born out of my mother's womb asking why. <laughs> not why, but not why, but why about everything in life? So I remember when I was small enough that I stood on the uh, standing up in the back seat of the car and my head did not hit the roof of the car. So I wasn't very tall. And now I remember thinking back all the time. I'd think about something and I'd say, Dad, uh, how come da 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 da? Dad, how come da 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 da? And we were going to uh, the Cleveland Indians baseball game, me and my sister and my brother. And I, you know, I was asking my dad a question about something on the way. And my sister said, um, why do you always have to ask so many questions for? Well, I'm sorry, that's the way I was wired. So um, um, when I came to accept and believe that there is a God, that Yeshua is the Messiah, and, and the words that he says are true, the words that he says is true, that caused me to ask the question, which leads to another question, which leads to another question. See, ultimately, you ask uh, until you uh, get to a dead end. So, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Um, and uh, often what we do is sometimes we read the text according to our preconceived already beliefs. And, and, and we think of the text to say what our preconceived beliefs are instead of what the text actually says. So Philippians 3.20 says, our citizenship is in heaven. Now, when I hear people comment about that, you know how they comment it? Oh, yeah. Because we're saved and born again, we're going to get to go to heaven. Is that what the text says? It says our citizen will, citizenship will be in heaven. It says it is. That means it is right now. Yeah. And you know what citizenship means? It's basically a statement of where you're from. So that, that verse says, you and I are from heaven. Because if I would be carrying a passport or whatever and show everyone where I'm from, my citizenship is in heaven, it says, well, who are you? Well, I'm from heaven. Well, if I'm from heaven, what am I doing here? <laughs> what am I doing on the earth? Well, in the big picture, looking at Earth in the very big picture, you know what Earth consists of? All peoples and languages and cultures, etc., is the composite Earth. And who lives in it? The Earth itself is Babylon. The Earth itself, and the people that's living in it. Okay. It's Babylon. Yeah. So, basically, when I'm living in Earth, I'm living in Babylon. If I'm living in Babylon, I'm living in exile. Yeah. So, basically, you're my life on this Earth. We are in exile. Yes. And um, so, um, why would we be in exile for? Well, uh, you know, the Torah is a blueprint of spiritual things. It's a blueprint of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt to the promise that that wasn't just something that literally happened. It did literally happen. Everything that happened to them and the, that we're supposed to study, what happened to them, it's a blueprint of spiritual things. So in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, what does it say um, there, the reason why the God of Israel brought the children of Israel into the wilderness? It was, it was to test them and to show them what was in their heart. To see whether they keep his commandments on. To prove them and to test them and to show them what was in their heart. Because I don't think they really totally knew and understood what was in their own heart. It had to be revealed. So one of the reasons why you're on this planet, why I'm on this planet, we're in exile. We're, we're in the wilderness. Earth is the wilderness compared to our citizenship as in heaven. So one of the reasons why you're here is it's to show you what's in your heart. 
It's to show you in a physical world or in the physical environment in your because actually if you was before heaven's court and you show who knows all things would say, you know, this and that's in your heart. You'd say, that's not in my heart. There's no way I can believe that's in my heart. Well, there's no place to show you what's in your heart except for in this world. Yeah. So he brings you into this world to uh, uh, to show you what's in your heart, to see whether you would keep his Torah, to see whether you would uh, keep his commandments or not. And so really, if you think about it, if the end outcome of my life and the end outcome of this world is we must all stand before the judgment seat of Messiah, then in a way our lives and the existence of this earth is just one big test. It's just a test to give you a certain amount of time and have circumstances to show it's in your heart, but it's a test to reveal the decisions about do you believe in a God? Do you believe in the God of Israel? Do you not believe in the God of Israel? If you do believe in the God of Israel, um, how do you feel about his kingdom? Do you love him? Do you love his kingdom? Do you love serving him? Um, do you say, I do, to be a servant in his kingdom? Do you say, I do, to doing um, his will in your life? Because um, the way he created us, he, he created us in conflict so that there would be a true test. So part of us, our flesh wants to do a certain thing, but our spirit man wants to serve and love God. And so we're tested to see whether we're going to do the will of the flesh or we're going to lay down the flesh to do the will of God in our lives. And so Yeshua becomes our example about how we are supposed to live our lives. You see, um, Paul understood that you're to be like your master. You see, in those days, the disciple followed their, their rabbi around everywhere they went to learn how he lived, how he responded to certain situations, and to learn his teachings. And so we've somehow got this concept that he did it, and I don't have to do it. Well, in looking at Yeshua's life, what did he teach us? What did he say was the only purpose of his life? To do the will of his Father. So what should be the purpose of your life? To live your life, to do the will of your Heavenly Father. And so when, when Yeshua died on the tree... Um, what got nailed to the tree? His flesh. It's a spiritual picture that in order to do the will of God, you have to die to your flesh. In order to do the will of God, you got to die to your flesh. And if we, and if we do accept, maybe some people don't, that the tree that he died on somehow was like this, it speaks of we have to have a vertical relationship with Yah. And we have to be, have a relationship with other people. We have to love him, and we need to love other people. So, this is a part of the testimony of Yeshua. His testimony is his Torah, which he gave to us, and he wants us to be faithful witnesses. He wants us to live our lives before men, uh, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And he wants us to be lights in a dark world. And he wants the world to see that we're different, that we follow him. That's why he asked to come out to the Feast of Tabernacles, because the world doesn't celebrate the, the Feast of Tabernacles. So that the world looks at you, looks at your life, and, and, and says... Why are you so blessed? Um, how are you different? Well, I, I serve and, and, and I believe in the God of Israel. And I love him and I keep his commandments. And so you are testifying to others through the life that you live and the, the fruit 
that you bear um, in living your life where people look at your life and uh, and, and, and they say, when your days are, not, are up, you know, you left a legacy. You left something that can be passed on to others because you let your light shine before men uh, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So uh, may, us, may all of us be lights for Yeshua that um, he would be pleased with the testimony that we show in this world to him and to others. Amen? Amen. Amen.